Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. We are broadcasting to you today, again, live from the Holly Alden Mormon Stories Studios in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, it is December 13th, 2018. Uh, I'm Dr. John DeLynn, and we could not be more excited, somber, celebratory, grateful, sad, angry, we couldn't uh, be any more of those things than we are today because today we are interviewing again, bringing back to Mormon Stories podcast, Dr. Gina Colvin. Gina is well known and well beloved all throughout uh, progressive and post Mormonism. Uh, she is a, a, a blogger. Kiwi Mormon was the blog that she burst onto the progressive Mormon scene. Um, she uh, took over a thoughtful face pod, a thoughtful faith podcast. She's been hosting that for years now. Uh, she is the editor, author of cool books, including a book that we recently featured, uh, which I have behind me, which is decolonizing Mormonism. Is that what it's called, Gina? It is, yes. Uh, which is a really great and important book, and uh, we're here today uh, to catch up with Gina, but also. We are here with Gina Colvin today because in seven days from today, she is scheduled to be excommunicated from the uh, Mormon church in New Zealand uh, by her bishop. Um, and the accusations against her include, number one, uh, being baptized into the Anglican faith. Uh, number two, her continued profession of membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're going to talk about that. Uh, three... Um, active criticism of the church and its leaders in public forums, and for public advocacy for positions which are contrary to the core doctrines of the church. So like we have done with Sam Young, with Bill Reel, with the Calderwoods, with uh, Denver Snuffer, with Rock Waterman, uh, Kate Kelly, and others, uh, here on Mormon Stories Podcast, we don't look at excommunication as something to be shamed about. We look at ex excommunication as a sign of, as a sure sign that you are being impactful in influencing Mormon doctrine, theology, practice, policy. We look at it as a deep honor. It means that you're so effective and you've struck such an important, true, credible nerve that you've uh, captured the church's attention. You've struck fear into their hearts. And it basically means they're going to be making changes around whatever thing you are complaining about. And that seems to be very consistent that the church uh, excommunicates its most important voices as it or eventually will make the changes that these uh, that these so-called apostates uh, are requesting. And it's all of that and more with Dr. Gina Colvin. And so we are going to be covering her faith journey since our last interview with her. We're going to be talking about uh, her um, affiliation with the Anglican Church we're going to be talking about her um, spiritual growth and evolution, what she's been doing on the Thoughtful Faith podcast. And then we're going to talk about her interactions with her uh, leadership, uh, her thoughts on the disciplinary council, um, how Nathan, her husband, is doing, how this is affecting her health, her family. And we're going to talk about uh, her future, um, whatever she's going to do, and you know, within a Mormon context as well. So without any further ado, Dr. Gina Colvin, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Oh, kia ora, John. Tēnā koe. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Well, it's all from the heart. Um, thanks for joining us. So, um, all right. So we've got, a, we've got some stuff to cover. And of course, we're live streaming this. So we want to invite, we've got already 60 people joining us. Please share this right now on your Facebook feeds. We want the world of Mormons and post-Mormons and progressive Mormons to hear from the people that the church is throwing out for apostasy. We want the, the membership to know that the church is doing this, and we want them to understand who they're excommunicating and why. And so I just want to challenge, I don't know, at least 30 of you to share this on your walls, um, and I'll be tracking over time how many shares we have. But the more shares we have, the more word gets out and the more we can uh, hold the church accountable for, for what it's doing and get the word out to support Gina 
because Gina absolutely deserves our support. Um, so, so again, all of you joining us live, thank you. And please put your uh, comments and questions in the podcast, in the Facebook live video stream, and we'll, we'll try to incorporate them as we go. So Gina, without any further ado, um, how are you feeling? Uh, well, as I mentioned to you, John, it's an interesting time. It's liminal space. Something is impending and uh, you don't relish it, but you wish it was over. And this, yeah. I mean, it's been a long game. This has been going on, uh, well, I mean, for several years, but the formalities have been going on since May this year. Yeah. And it kind of wears you out after a while, right? It does. I'm not outraged by it. It's entirely expected. I think the moment that you start speaking up, uh, the reality of the church is that it's going um, to uh, have a reaction. And I'm just sad that this is the reaction, but not surprised. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get into all that um, as we go throughout this episode. But let's start. And, and Gina, if you don't mind, this may seem a little bit weird, but we, you know, I want to refer listeners to previous interviews with Gina on Mormon Stories podcast. We'll include them in the live stream and in the um, show notes because we've done an episode or two where Gina tells her full story. But I want to give you the same chance for those who don't know anything about you, who haven't had the chance yet. Can you give us kind of the five minute, <laughs> and I know that's uh, a lot to ask, kind of the five minute summary of your kind of Mormon story, uh, just so people get a flavor for your your background that, that we would have covered in another podcast? Sure. Uh, my mother... I should start with my father. My father is, comes from a very large Mormon, a Maori Mormon family. Uh, and he met my mother in the city which I live in, which is Christchurch. Uh, they uh, had a relationship, a quick relationship. They didn't get married, but and decided once my mother was pregnant with me to break up. Because I think he was already married or he was in the, he was in the processes, process um, of divorce. Uh, but she joined the church. She came from an Anglican background and she joined the church and stayed pretty faithful, actually. There was, as a single mother, I think it made her terribly vulnerable. So she ended up marrying a Catholic man. Uh, so my spiritual formation sort of began in the LDS church, but I was looked after. She was a working mother and I was looked after by a Baptist family who took care of me, were wonderful, wonderful people just who lived down the road. They were Dutch also. So I was somewhat raised in the Dutch tradition with the Dutch language, uh, going to a Mormon church and a Baptist church. Then she marries another man and he's Catholic and he prevented us from going to the LDS church. Uh, and then uh, when I was about 16, I decided I wanted, I had a phenomenal experience about going back to church. It was as crystal clear. Like it's time, and I woke up one morning and it came to me, it's time for me to go back to church. So that was at 16 or 17. Uh, my stepfather made it very difficult for me to continue to be adherent in the LDS tradition. And so I left home and I was taken in by the state president's family who became very, very dear to me, who really did what Mormons do. They become family. Uh, and I married very young who, to a man who became a bishop we were married for three years and we broke up because he had ha had an affair. And then a couple of years later, Nathan and I married. And uh, in terms of my activity in the church, it's been pretty solid, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I've been the Relief Society president, the Young Woman's president the, on several occasions, primary president. Um, I've served in the stake and at the ward levels. Uh, so I think it wasn't until we adopted fostered, I should say, permanently fostered slash adopted four children all at once. Uh, and that created, uh, uh, and people who have a lot of children will understand this, um, a huge rupture. Uh, and because in, in the Mormon world, you just keep going and I couldn't keep going. We were both doing our PhDs. We were both working and suddenly we had a house full of pre, um, preschool children and the church just, and I, I think this was just more lack of sensitivity, but just had us keep going. And I didn't know at that point how I could just keep going. And I think that really is what made my shelf 
break. But I still, I always loved it. I still love it. I still love the LDS church. Uh, but um, I became part of like an online conversation. I'm looking for people who feel the same way as me. And I think it was after the Helen Whitney PBS documentary, which I watched over and over and over again. Uh, I went looking for the September 6th. And I found, I think, John, you posted those videos on YouTube of them the 10 years later. And I watched Levina's uh, talk at Sunstone over and over again. And I thought, is that really my church? Is that really my church? And that started a whole lot of questions. Uh, so I don't, and I just want to skip forward. Um, I, I don't think that I had ever thought that I would leave the church and I still kind of don't because I have a husband who's very much involved uh, but uh, there was there I, I was noticing that I had my head in this idea and, and my rage and my emotional experience in the Mormon context and nothing was nurturing me spiritually so I went and found another community which was fabulous and we'll talk about that I guess so when you um, when you started your blog Kiwi Mormon, what what was the status of your kind of faith and your beliefs, and what was your goal with Kiwi Mormon when you started that? Uh, in terms of my, uh, well, I mean, what is belief? That's an existential question. I've always thought of Mormonism as a community, a faith community. Uh, I, I don't know that I have always been in good relationships with its belief system but then I don't believe that many Mormons are really when you think hard enough about it and I was gospel I think I was gospel doctrine teacher at that time and, and had been for about eight or nine years uh, you know you see that people are all over when it comes to their belief system and your job as a teacher to, is to get people to voice that and to and to discuss that and to kind of create something as a community so in terms of my belief I was there there was never any question that I would continue. Um, and I wanted the, and, and doing Kiwi Mormon, we just had this massive earthquake and our church, our stake had gone through a lot of issues with how to respond to a natural disaster. Uh, we had a state president who had gone AWOL uh, and he ended up leaving the church. We had all kinds of leadership problems. And when we, as a group of people uh, in my ward wanted to respond and it was mostly warm, women when we wanted to respond to the needs of other Mormons and our general community we were told constantly you need to go through the proper channels now you don't do that during a natural disaster whatever kind of leadership emerges emerges and you take hold of that then suddenly I was seeing all of us who were wanting to make a difference for our city being chopped down saying no we can't open the bishop's storehouse because we don't have approval from such and such a person who's actually just left the city because they lost their house. So it was just, there was all sorts of crazy making in that, in that, uh, in that space. So that had me, and, and, we were, and it felt like we had to approve to an external approval system, external um, authority. And the United States church, the US church and the New Zealand church was, outside of our city seemed equally incapable of responding. Uh, and that really made me think, where are we as a, as a nation? Where am I as a Maori woman in this church? How, what would have to happen for us to be heard and our needs to be taken seriously? And so I think that's when out of that, I think is when I started blogging and saying, kind of look at us. Like you're always asking us to look at you as Americans you know, we're more than your petted savages. We're more than people who show up and to do a, a cultural dance when general authorities arrive and you get you eat our food. You know, we're actually, we have a theology, we have a consciousness, we have a political orientation, an economic orientation. Um, we are our own separate culture and we have things that we can, we can share with the world. So how about you just start listening? So that's, that's where it came from. Mm. So beautiful and powerful. What year was that about? I think I started my blog in 2012, the year after our earthquake. And th this is going to sound weird because in so many ways, I think one of the behind the scenes dialogues you and I have had is how important is belief and 
orthodoxy versus not. But uh, I think to a lot of people, it's important. So I'm just going to ask, like, how would you describe your 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 orthodox versus unorthodox Mormon beliefs, maybe when you started your blog? Uh, just so we can get a sense for where things were when you started, and then we can talk about how it, if, if or how it's changed since then. I can't remember, actually, to be honest. Uh, I can't remember what I believed in 2012. I, okay. It, yeah. Oh, no, I want to, I want to mention something else. Uh, Nathan had got a postdoc in Wellington, and we went to this ward, and it was very, very conservative, and I was in the throes of trying to finish my doctorate. And uh, what was your doctorate in? Uh, it, it's in journalism, but it's a sociology. It's in, in indigenous um, discourses, political discourses, and in the management of indigenous indigeneity in the 19th century. But yeah, you know, very boring. But um, no, not boring. <laughs> uh, so we went to this new ward, and I was sort of just, you know, in those first stages of faith crisis where everything feels like it's falling apart. And I think I took some of my irritation to uh, that new ward, people who didn't know me and couldn't tolerate the fact that I was, every, every day I looked like, every Sunday I looked like my brains were going to explode. Uh, and I remember going to renew my, I was just about to go to the States with my family uh, to Utah and I had to renew my temple recommend because we wanted to attend the temple together. And I went into this, this interview and the person who was interviewing me was a counselor on the state presidency. And he said, I hear you talk a lot about Jesus Christ. I hear your testimony, and that's all very nice, but I don't see you, I hear you say much about President Monson. And I said, well, um, that's a very, and, and, and then he invited me to share my testimony of President Monson. This is just, be, this is before the Temple Recommend had, interview had really started proper. I said, well, I think that's improper. It's inappropriate for you to ask me that. I know what your job is, and it, it's to open that book and ask me the questions. But here goes. I haven't heard of President Monson searing anything, revealing anything, or prophesying anything. But I sustain him if he ch so chooses to do so. Now you, you said this back in 2012? Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, and then he stopped the interview. He said, well, I'm not going to give you the interview because we as a state presidency have already decided that you're not worthy and your testimony isn't strong enough. And I think at that point I raced home and I, I, he was very, very lucky I didn't swear because um, that would be my general reaction. Uh, and I raced home and I thought, I'm not doing this anymore. And I said to Nathan, I'm not doing it anymore. It's too hard. And he, with tears in his eyes, he said, if you don't, like the way it is, why don't you change it? Um, and I thought, I love this man enough to give this a go. Uh, and I don't know what that means. So I suppose in 2012, a couple of years later, it was sort of me beginning to think if I, the only way that I could really stay because it felt so terribly, terribly spiritually abusive, the only way that I feel I could stay is to feel like I'm also I could also make a difference to the hurt that the church sometimes causes. Uh, so that's why I think that it kind of comes back. To I that. relate to that. That that staying that that becoming an activist is the tax for for staying. It's the way that you feel better about sticking around. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you mentioned the September six videos as kind of your on ramp a little bit. I think about all the. Mormons in non-US or non-Western European countries that I perceive to be largely oblivious to anything that's any Mormon blog, any Mormon podcast, any Mormon social activist movement. They're just, you know, sort of oblivious to all that. So I'm always curious to hear what someone's on-ramp is to progressive liberal, you know, Mormonism. So you're saying were those Sunstone September 6th videos the first or were there, do you remember how you stumbled on this world of progressive liberal Mormonism? Well, to be fair, my, my foster father, my adopted father, he was the state president. And I think I've said this before. He was very, very liberal. So he was good friends with Leonard Arrington. He was this distinguished professor of history. So I grew up like in my later teens in a home that was always engaged. We had dialogue, we had Jean England stuff. So there was all that, always that conversation 
brewing in my formative, my early spiritual formation as a Mormon. Uh, but um, I think I watched that documentary, that Helen Whitney documentary, yeah. and what really stood out to me was Margaret Toscano's recounting of that. Uh, the disciplinary that, council. That disciplinary council. And there was so much resonance in what she said. And I thought, yeah. okay, I need to understand what's happening because when she said there is so much violence and the nice, not in the niceness, um, it exploded something in me. And it was as if all of this sort of burgeoning knowing kind of rushed into me at once. And I thought, oh, I need to find out about the September 6th that they're talking about. Yeah, for, for, for those who are avid Mormon Stories listeners, they'll know I just interviewed Helen Whitney, who was the director of that documentary. Um, but, but those who haven't seen it yet, go back and watch it. It was released 2007. So much, that was so influential. I learned about Michael Coe from that series that, that, sh, that Helen Whitney did. I learned about Terrell Givens from that. That's where that quote from, from uh, Elder Oaks, that smarmy quote that it's wrong to criticize the church leaders, even if the criticism is accurate. I believe it comes from that. Um, so many, so many important, uh, and maybe that was Packer, but um, oh, there were so many good quotes, but Greg Prince was on that and he interviewed, she interviewed Elder Holland, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, who was prophet, like such a groundbreaking thing, along with Margaret Toscano and so many others, Will Bagley, like, a real, real remarkable who's who achievement in mm. Mormonism. Yeah. So check that out. Okay, so that that influenced you, your exposure to some of that stuff early on. And then was it blogs? What was your, I mean, if you started out as a blogger, it must have been like, were you turning in the F Feminist Mormon Housewives blog or by Common Consent blog or Times of Seasons blog prior to, to, to 2012? I feel like if I say no, I'm going to offend a lot of friends. No, 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 be honest. <laughs> well, I found your, you know, I found Mormon stories. Okay. And I, and, and I listened to a few and I'm like, what the hey? I think, yeah. you know, to start with, it was all a bit much for me. Uh, but it did tickle alive a lot of questions. So I think, you know, I found Mormon stories uh, and I went, oh, yeah, I can't remember. I don't know that I was engaging. It felt like it was another person, people's other people's conversations because it was all American, right? right? And I thought, I'm just a Kiwi. Um, what do I have to offer? Or, you know, what can I ask these people? Right. Uh, so, it, so it was sort of like in this sort of third dimension of, as an observer. No, that makes sense. Okay, so, so Kiwi Mormon was your way to try and make things better. And... And you did that for what? How many years before you, you joined on a, a Thoughtful Faith? Oh, I started in 2012, and I can't remember when we, we started doing. You've at least been doing faith. it for three years, I'm guessing, right? Four, I think more, maybe four, five. Five, four five. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, at, at some point, you took on a Thoughtful Faith podcast. Talk about why you, why you started a podcast. Because you asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I just loved your I just loved your writing. I I don't know of a more gifted, entertaining, thoughtful, witty, uh, brilliant, sharp uh, writer in Mormonism than you. Oh, that's very kind. Uh, yeah, and I thought, and it was just a lovely, uh, it was just a lovely opportunity. I thought, oh, okay, well, if we can broaden the conversation to include more people from outside of the United States. That would be fabulous. So I, I, you know, I said yes because that was the goal. As it happens, not many people on the out, outside of the United States really want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I struggled to find people. I think my first interview was Karis Bray, who's the writer of a song for Izzy Bradley, such yeah. a fabulous writer. And I had read that, I devoured that book, and I thought, okay, my first, my first interview was English, and the last one I did was with a group of Maori. So I've tried really hard to mix it up. Yeah, but but so many U.S. Mormons don't care about what's going on outside, no. and then yeah, so many people outside, like you said, just either move on or don't want to talk about it. It's hard. Yeah, it, it's very conservative outside of the like. It's one thing to be in Utah where there's all these iterations of Mormonism that you can find yourself involved with. I mean, there's Sunstone, and then there's 
you know, dialogue stuff and people having, you know, faith again things. So you can kind of find your group. But outside of the United States, it, the church tends to be dominated in terms of leadership by people who are able to imitate Utah Mormonism enough to uh, gain the trust of visiting authorities who appoint state presidents and, and bishops. So, I mean, I, I think in the case, well, no, I don't want to na name the nation, but there is a, a European nation in which one family that does Mormonism really brightly and well, just like an American would. Uh, has dominated church leadership in that country for yeah. you know decades. Uh, so I mean, there's this all this cultural imitation that has to happen in order to 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 be successful outside of the church, which means that you're contracting the conversation. We never indigenize, we never contextualize, and also because it's such a narrow um, expression of Mormonism uh, that people become so kind of enclosed and over identified with it. And that, for me, that makes your achievement a little bit more remarkable because, you, you know, for the past five to 10 years, people could name, you know, kind of the modern progressive and post-Mormon, I'll just say celebrities or figureheads or leaders. And, you know, you could go down the list, whether it's various podcast hosts or activists or bloggers or whatever, there's been almost none outside the U.S., and you are among the most prominent voices, and you're probably the only one I'm aware of that isn't isn't from here. Yeah, and I'm being punished for it, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, talk about your evolution with the thoughtful faith, because um, you know there's you look at Bill Real, you look at me and others. There's there's sort of this joke, and I've I've said this I said this in the Bill Real podcast. People used to joke to me, as Bill Real is, John DeLynn once was, and as John DeLynn is, Bill Real may become, you know, and it's just this idea that whether it's Leonard Arrington or Eugene England or Lowell Benyon or, you know, fast forward to modern times, me or Bill Real or, or you, you know, there are these naive, big hearted uh, Mormons that love the church so much they're going to try and be the bridge between thought and faith and consciousness and social activism and faith. And so they assume that position and they, they toil in it at much sacrifice often for many years, but that the, the fate is often predictable that either they wear out or the church, it gets worn out by them, but either way, it's an untenable position. So before I'm kind of giving a foreshadowing, obviously, but talk about like, I remember bringing you on with Thomas McConkie, for example, and, you know, throughout the past several years, you were really optimistic that you could be that bridge. And let's just say even a year or two prior to any affiliation you have with the Anglican church. So talk about what you were hoping to try and do and then what happened to that, because I, I haven't fully heard that story. I don't know if I've articulated that story yet. I mean, well, take was your I time. To, take your time. I, I, I mean, was I helping to be a bridge? I, the thing that I was noticing was people's pain that in this epic or this moment or era of faith crisis, the thing that really stuck out to me is the poor pastoral practice and responding to that. And so people were stuck in this space. I mean, you know this as well as ever, anybody. People were stuck in this painful space of not being able to, um, to move. Uh, and I think one of the things that I noticed is people were trying to manage that intellectually. They weren't trying to find a new kind of certainty. So if the church is all wrong, then that would mean that they could leave the church. That would be an excuse to, 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 to bow out. And I thought, we're talking faith here. We're talking religion. Surely there is more to this conversation than whether or not the church is wrong. All churches are wrong. And people like to explain to me that all churches are wrong and fake, etc. And I don't disagree. I do not disagree. Uh, and my going to the Anglican Church or Episcopal Church is not me saying that that church is true. That's me saying that 
in the end, what I needed was what was what brought me into the church was a sense of my own interiority. It, it, it brought me into kind of this deep sense of my own spiritual being. And I think that that has been a beautiful gift of Mormonism. It sparked that alive. It aroused it. But when it wanted to go further than that, when I when my kind of soul was pushing out a little bit more, I was blaming the church for its doctrines or its practices. But really at the heart of it, it's it's the, the issue is not that. It's the issue that the church wouldn't let me grow. It wouldn't allow my soul growth. It wanted to circumscribe me within this comfortable place and it wouldn't let me develop. So I so, thought I'm maybe, yeah, go ahead. No, keep going. No, I don't want to interrupt. Um, I can't remember what it okay. uh, I was so, so let's go back three or four years um, you're, you're, you're doing the podcast. You're optimistic that you're, you're still active in the church. You're still attending and mm. you know, you're learning about, or you're, you're, you're probably learning about Richard Rohr at some point. You're probably, you know, well-versed in Eugene England's why the church is as true as the gospel. You're, you're connecting with other thoughtful, faithful Mormons again, like Thomas McConkie and others, and you're attending church. So what, what, what wasn't working as you were trying to do those things? Like, tell us some stories. Were there things about your lived church experience in your wards or in your stake that, that, that made that difficult or that bumped up against what you were trying to do? Or were there, I, I, I kind of want you to try and get into that story a little bit, even chronologically, if you can, I know it's asking you to remember some stuff, but. Yeah, it, it is tricky. I, I, grew up in a stake uh, you know for years I attended a ward in which I have family members like there are on both sides of our family there are four generations you know we can look out at the kids and most of them are related in some way so it was a very safe place for me we had a wonderful bishop who and it was like a camelot so I was the gospel doctrine teacher and so there was always uh there were always being very kind and loving me as they had always done. And even though, and I, and I was very careful, mostly not to bump up against, you know, bring my angst because these are people that I loved. Uh, and not always. And sometimes there were some missteps, my kind of muttering and huffing, huffing and puffing when something gets said from the stand, but people, you know, generally took it really well. They're like, Oh, Gina. Uh, uh, but you know, they made a, a lovely space for me. Uh, I resigned, I think I resigned as the gospel doctrine teacher in 2012 or asked to be released because I was getting this curriculum and I'm thinking I can't sit behind this anymore. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, and so they called myself and um, the former State Relief Society president and somebody else who'd been the young woman's president as the primary presidency. And we had a fabulous time. We just broke all of the rules we fed children. We played games in the gymnasium with them and let them run around. We did drama. We just broke all of the rules. And then we had a group of people who were, knew less about us and didn't know us particularly well start, begin complaining. Then we had a change of bishop. Uh, and I suppose the pastoral care that I was used to wasn't there. And, um, and then the people who were, I was serving in the primary presidency with, they left the church, <laughs> like in this kind of big huff because one of them, you know, people say it's my fault, but let me just say for the record, <laughs> it's not my fault. One of them had been reading, listening to Lindsay Hanson Park's Year of Polygamy. And so it's Lindsay's fault. Um, <laughs> Susie is Lindsay's fault. And then my friend Nicola, um, she realized as the State Relief Society president that she had no uh, power and, and then that coincided with the November policy. And she, she and her husband thought, no, we're done. Um, well, that was a big, that was a big blow. A big turning point was the November 2015 policy, but, but I don't want to rush the story. So keep going. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely that was, and I looked at this and I took a sabbatical <laughs> it last all of a couple of months. I took it. I, I thought I can't do this. This is blowing my head apart. I, I, I just, I simply can't do this. And I thought, well, maybe I should resign. And I, uh, I was that furious about it. And I said to my husband, um, Nathan, I said, you know, I, I can't stand behind this. I think that was a turning point. The November policy was a turning point. Uh, and, I and, I, and I said to him, I can't stand this. I don't want to be complicit with this anymore. 
And so, uh, but, you know, he was devastated. He, the look on his face was, you know, it was, it was shocking. You know, he was absolutely devastated. And I thought, we can't mess this relationship up because of the church. Like, it's not worth it. So I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I'll keep giving it a go. Um, and I kind of, I, I went back, but, and then we, then we, and I was, I was sort of fine managing it. Good people around participating in all of my classes. And then they changed the ward boundaries. And so I was, we were, our family was sort of like carved off, sent to a ward in which I knew hardly anybody and hardly anybody knew me. And, uh, and then I had, <laughs> it's, it's a funny story. I think it was last year. It was not a funny story. It's a shocking story. I was in church and they were always, you know, I, if you go to church these days, everything is about the priesthood. And I had been at, uh, actually, can I just go back? Because in amongst that, we have Kate's excommunication. And I had been involved in. That's 2014, right? 2014. I'd been involved in that. And we, as a group of women, were very, very supportive of this. And I went to the action with Kate. And when she was excommunicated, boy, that that sent shockwaves. And my state president, who is, who, who's been fabulous, to, we were at a, 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 ward, a stake activity. He took me aside and he said, you need to talk, don't you? And he was so kind and understanding and pretty much said, you know, I don't know that I would have done that. And, and then I had calls from people who, uh, you know, someone who had been my bishop beforehand to say, I'm really, really sad that this happened. So I think we underestimate the effect of that excommunication. And there's your excommunication, which is a little bit more predictable. Um, you know, po Kate was a bit of a Pollyanna. Like, surely if we just asked the prophet, he could pray about it, you know, <laughs> surely. <laughs> um, it's a bit more like Sam's, you know, Sam Young's excommunication. So that really, really affected a lot of us. It was sort of a worm began to turn and then there was the, Dece the December policy. Uh, and, it, and then personally, as we moved towards all of those supports, all of that tolerance that had been there before was not, I, I was subject to the eye rolling. You know, Mormons can be mean, like terribly mean. When they're not being terribly nice, they can be terribly mean. Uh, and so I was in gospel doctrine one day and I said to the teacher who was talking about the priesthood, and it's always noticeable when it seems to have been a pattern in my wards that it's pretty noticeable when I, A, I say something and, wait, I, and B, when I don't say anything. So the teacher came to me and he said, you know, I've noticed that you're pretty quiet. Do you want to talk about that? And I said, uh, I said, I'm just so tired of coming to church and everything is about the priesthood. And I, I don't know what the objective is, but I'm somebody who feels that women should be ordained. And what do you, I come to church and I'm constantly reminded that I can't have that which you're talking about. All I get to be is obedient to that by your reckoning. And he stood, sat with it for a bit and he goes, would you like to tell the class about that? And I was, I was sort of simultaneously, oh, this could go very wrong, but oh, okay, what a great opportunity. So I spent the week very prayerfully preparing something and I wanted to honor the woman who had made our stake our stake uh, and all of the work that they put into uh, and to the building of the church and our part of the world when there were not the priesthood holders to do it. So on that following Saturday, a Sunday, I got up and I began to speak very, I thought very kindly. And I didn't want to offend people. And I knew that this was a big risk. And then all of these people, and, and I'm in the middle and I'm crying. Um, and all of these people got up and they walked out. And they it was heartbreaking. Out? I walked out of my class. Yeah. Oh my, like in the middle of it? In the middle of it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was shocking. I was shocking. I was ready for the conversation. I was ready for some pushback. Uh, but I wasn't ready for people just to walk out. And it was, you know, I'm sort of remembering it now, how pa painful that is. Um. And then that followed like a huge fight after church with a woman in the ward. And I heard, I had heard her over, you know, say to somebody every week, it's the same every week she destroys the spirit. 
every week I dread coming to church because of her. And I said to her, you know what? I wish you'd talk to me about this. She goes, I will not talk to you. And uh, um, gosh, I'm really emotional about this, but it was, you know, it was, it was, it was quite shocking. And then, you know, <laughs> I said, if, you know, how can we have a relationship? How can we work this out if you're not hearing me? And, you know, if you won't hear me, she said, well, I don't want to talk to you. And if I have to talk to you, I'll leave the church. I said, don't worry, I will. So I think that was, you know, I try, I mean, we since have spoken. And then, and then I do have to say, because there, there <laughs> my friend um, Lynn Matthews Andrews was, uh, Andrews Matthews, sorry, Lynn, she was visiting the ward as well. And uh, we kind of laugh about that now because it involved this huge blow up after. And I just lost my shit. Um, and said, you know, what is this? What is this? You know, and I, and uh, there was a group of people in the in the um, in the chapel after, uh, and I said, I don't even understand it. Like, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to come to church and be robotic. We're supposed to be conforming. We're supposed to say what we're supposed to say. When are we going to grow up as a community and actually grow with each other and tolerate people's differences? Is this all we do? Because I could stay home and read the curriculum manual. And the general conference talks, there's no point coming here if this is all that it involves. So it was heartbreaking. But I did give the um, youth a great deal of pleasure who all sort of heard the, the yelling that went on and came to watch. So I made their day. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, and I just have to say, I so relate to that because I was teaching elders quorum and and the same thing, I had people just say, John, this isn't why I come to church. I don't come to church to have to hear intriguing questions or controversial things. I come to be uplifted. And I'll never forget. And for them, uplifted meant, let's just talk about the same old things that make me feel comfortable, which is, it's not that lady's fault, right? Like that's, yeah. that's just her worldview. Yeah, yeah. Her, her orthodoxy, her level, stage three, Fowler stage three, orthodoxy brought her comfort and anything that challenged that brought you comfort but caused her discomfort and yeah. she's one of just millions of mormons that are that way so i know you're not picking on her it's just she happened to be in the way right yeah i'm not picking on her it just it it, it, it was a culmination of a number of things and you know and i have to say that i got very good care for my Relief Society president and the stake relief council and the stake relief society presidency who were there and they said some bubbles need to be burst. Like, you know, some of our faith is in a bubble and it needs to be burst burst. And I think while I'm on this, I think there will there have been a lot of complaints about me from from members of my stake. Um and I think that would be okay if the stake president see and the, the church leaders said, go and talk to her. But I've had people like home visiting teachers pulled because they're afraid that I'm a contaminant. Now, when you become a contaminant, it makes continued adherence really, really difficult. Uh, but at the same time, you love it. These are your people. This is how you've been formed. Uh, and to feel that palpable rejection of your immediate community. I mean, I would still be on the pew if people were, had been kinder about our faith development and the changes, if they'd been more informed, um, I would still be on the, on the pew. No question. That's where I would be. And yet somehow it's not their fault. Like, no, is there, have you studied Richard Rohr? A bit. Yeah. Apparently he makes this point that, that Mormons do the first half of life really well, but really stink at the second half. Like, <laughs> We are not a church that that encourages kind of that Fowler stage four to Fowler stage five kind of thing, right? Right, right. It's just not. It's not what we do. Other. That's what other churches do. It's not what we do. Yeah. Well, I mean, and not all churches, and some people, you know, some churches. And and can I also say that about five years ago, I was so tired and spiritually exhausted because so little reference to Jesus Christ, and that's that's why I show up. That's why I always showed up, because I feel profoundly Christian. And so I started attending the Baptist church. 
and uh, and people were so kind there that the senior pastor there is a man called Alan Jameson who actually did a postdoctorate with James Fowler. So he was all about Fowler's stages of faith uh, and how do we create environments of what they call multi multinodal faith where people are expressing their faith at different levels? How do we keep people together? So there's a lot of work that's gone into this. How do you manage faith development? And I remember talking to Alan and he stopped, you know, we were chatting about faith development and he said, how are you? How are you? And it was just the first kind of pastoral care that I had received. And, um, he said, you know, if I was your pastor, I'd, I would I'd bless your journey to go. Go and, and search and become. And if you come back to us, we'd be really grateful for what you had learned. Uh, and, and that was the first really beautiful and wise pastoral care that I had received. Everybody else was kind, but it was more a tolerating kind, like uh, kindness. Like they were saying, you know, we really love you. We want, we want you to stay. Um, but there wasn't a kindness in terms of noticing that this was actually a very intuitive and trustworthy process. And let's work with that. Let's bless this journey of Gina's. And let's, let's notice how she's returning to our community. What, what is, what, how is this journey gifting her with understanding um, about her own spirituality? But they wouldn't witness it. It was just, we have to tolerate this, we'll be kind, but we're not going to witness this as anything but aberrant. And we just hope with, with, with white knuckled, uh, with white knuckles that she'll come back. And, and this is part of the, the desperate need for evolution of the church because, and this is the dilemma the, or, the, the stage three, the Fowler stage three Orthodox members um, are the ones who, you know, stack the chairs and put up the chairs. They're the ones who sign up to deliver the casseroles. They're the ones who take the crap callings and pay the tithing, full tithing, either full net or full gross. But they're the ones who keep the lights on in the church. And so on the one hand, the church doesn't want to ever do anything to disrupt them because not all people that leave Fowler stage three remain in the church, get to Fowler stage five. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, I think more often than not, if a Mormon hits Fowler stage four, they're more likely to leave and even become an atheist or an agnostic than they are to either stay in the church or affiliate with another religious tradition. So the, I know the church is either consciously or subconsciously thinking on the one hand, yeah, it sucks that the people have such immature faith that they can't handle sincere questions and honest dialogue and progressive ideology, like, like the stuff you were trying to, and, and, and true spiritual growth, right? And maturity. Um, so it sucks. But on the other hand, if we destroy our base, we're, we're left with nothing because the progressives and liberals aren't going to aren't going to be loyal and faithful to us at the end of the day. They're as capricious and as unreliable as anyone. You know what I mean? It's yeah. got to be hard for the church to walk that line. I mean, the interesting thing that, and particularly where I am, is that we're a social democratic nation. So we don't have those hard and fast lines between kind of progressive, uh, a progressive hermeneutic or an orthodox hermeneutic of faith. Uh, because I think we're pretty open politically we don't have those harsh divisions um but i think you're right in as much as uh i, I remember going to let me just backtrack i remember going to the oakland ward and there's something oakland first ward there's something kind of dissonant and heretical about that ward they've always sort of done what they want to do Is like on carolyn the, pearson's, on, carolyn pearson's no, ward? i think she's in walnut grove or oh, whatever okay. walnut Creek. Maybe, yeah something so this is an and and um, you know, in the stake center by, by uh, the Oakland Temple. So when they decide to do something, they don't seek permission. Uh, and the Salt Lake gets interested and says, hey, how come you're doing this thing? And they're like, because it makes sense. And they say, well, you can't do that. You know, Salt Lake will say, you can't do that. They're like, well, just watch us. Um, 
and that's the sort of privilege and confidence that being close to the center of the church and having uh, some wealth uh, and being knowing, knowing that you 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 ha, you know that you um, will be taken seriously because of your status in the community. That's what what it buys you. But you come to New, you know a place like New Zealand and the UK and Scotland, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, the default is sort of like an odd, a cultural kind of perversion to be Mormon in the way that we're required to be Mormon means that we have to sort of front up to a culture that doesn't belong to us. We wear that very poorly. Uh, so what was, where was I going with this? I say, so, so it like the division isn't necessarily kind of orthodox and progressive. The division has been constituted around how obedient we are to whatever Salt Lake City is saying to us and how in sympathy we are with whatever is floating up, you know, across our, sh if, uh, up onto our shoreline from Salt Lake City. That's the division. Yeah, another way that I think about that is just to say that, that the most sacred thing to, for Mormonism in, in, in the 2010s, even the 2000s, or maybe always, has been authority. It's not Jesus. It's not the Bible. It's not the atonement. The most sacred thing in Mormonism is obedience to priesthood authority. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm just going to make a shout out to Steve Otteson, who who makes what I think is an astute observation that um, we can't allow, the church can't allow for stage four or five Mormons until the leaders get to those stages. Yes. And, and in reality, that's what happened with Community of Christ. It was the leaders that led out on the evolution of Community of Christ in the 60s and 70s. I don't think it was the members that led that charge. You know, no, no, and they suffered. I, I think, in terms of adherence and numbers, because they did that. But this yeah. is what Alan, Alan Jameson would say: you have to have um, your leadership team, and you know that he's often talking about just individual churches. But whoever is in leadership, you need to have them at least at a stage five. If we have to talk about Fowler's stage, but you need to have them having reconstructed their faith uh, and to be more universalist in order to cope with all of the the range and the spectrum uh, that you're going to get uh, in, in any given community. And I guess you could argue that someone like a Uchtdorf might be there. Um, and many of us had hopes that Oaks or Holland could get there, but there's gotta be something super hard when you arrive in the Quorum of the 12, where you really feel the weight of the office and the risks of making changes that could make things worse where that pull just keeps you from being able to manage as a stage five person, you know? Yeah. It would be impossible. I always think about Jeff Holland. I think he sounds like a man who's going through a faith crisis. <laughs> <laughs> he can come just, to me, Elder Holland. I'll help you out. I won't reject you. <laughs> okay. So getting back to your story, you know, you, you, you change wards where you're not in that ward that you felt super comfortable. You change some leadership. You had some friends leave the church and then as you try and be a thoughtful, faithful but, uh, member, and you, tr you, you always have to walk that balance of being silent and feeling like a second-class citizen or speaking out, making people uncomfortable, and then having to stay knowing that you're making people uncomfortable, that, that just wears you down. And it wore me down. <laughs> it wear, wears a lot of people down. Um, always managing your political social capital so that you can make that comment here or there. Some people are able to do it, but I did, did it wear you down? I think, yeah, it did wear me down. And I had, I had a temple recommend, I think up until, and always had a temple recommend. I, and I go back to that story that we had in that terrible ward. My husband jumped in. This is when, you know, they said that I couldn't have a, rec, a temple recommend interview. Um, Nathan jumped in because he's a man. He can do that. Uh, yeah. And tracked down the state president he said my wife deserves a temple recommend interview if anything comes out of that interview that is uh you know a cause for concern then we discuss that you discuss that with her then but you will give her an interview and if you're not at our house by seven o'clock with your temple recommend book an interview book in hand i will go 
I will go to the area. I will go to, you know, regions. I will go to the head offices and I will make an unrelenting complaint about you. So he was there at seven, one minute to seven. He was there and I got my temporary. Equipment. So, so I go back to about 2000 and when did Nathan and I last go through the temple? I think it was like two years ago, maybe two years ago. I can't recall. We, we went for the last time together through Salt Lake City. Uh, and it, it always felt like I had been making agreements that I ha- either had to fudge or, um, but, but the, these were agreements that I couldn't, I, cu- I couldn't meet up, you know, I couldn't a- agree to anymore. Uh, and so there was a very dramatic incident. I don't know. Am, am I that dramatic? I don't think I'm that dramatic. But a very dramatic incident down at the chapel with me throwing a temple recommend at my bishop. And my what bishop. was that about? How did that happen? Well, I was pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> something had happened with family and something I'd written. Everybody was really, really angry with me. And uh, and I went to the chapel. I'd piled all the boys. We call them chapels, the meeting house piled all the boys in our, in our minivan and raced down to where I knew that the bishop was. He was had a youth night and I presented him with my temporary recommend. I said, I don't want it. Uh, and I think, no, maybe I threw it at him or gave it to him vigorously. Uh, and then he followed me out. He said, we need to talk about this. And then he started saying that I caused all of these people to leave the church. And, and then I swore at him and he swore at me and I accused him of swearing and he said, I didn't swear, then apologize because he did swear. You know, it was just, and all my, my children who were sitting in the van were watching this. Uh, and I walked off in tears and I got to the van and one of my sons said, good on you, mum, you shouted at the bishop. So um, it was all very sort of silly and dramatic and immature of all of us. But uh, that was the last time I had a recommend. And I thought, I, and I felt relief, actually. I thought, okay, now I get to speak without feeling encumbered by by having to make agreements that I can no longer make agreements to. Yeah. And, and doesn't it, doesn't it come down to some sort of combination of the joy starts to go away, all the benefits and the joy start to go away. And then all the tension just becomes to mount to where it just becomes untenable. Yes. Now, not for everyone. There are people that make it work and we want to leave space for that, but it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> well, you know, when you're, when you're facing Sundays and a, a lot of us talk about, particularly women, I hear a lot from women, we talk about car park panic attacks. I'm, no, no, I'm pretty easy. I'm pretty kind of mellow when I'm not riled. But, you know, I get to church and I'd start sweating and I'd have anxiety attacks. And I've never had anxiety attacks before. Uh, and I only, and, and you know, on several occasions, I would push my way through, and it would, you know, and get into the, get into the chapel for sacrament meeting, get into my classes, and all of the time, I felt, I don't know, it's, I, I don't know, I mean, how do you explain it? You just sort of feel simultaneously furious, um, and out of sorts, and confused, and it's just, it sort of blackens everything, and uh, makes it very difficult to show up. And you feel really bad because you actually love the people that you're sitting next to. Uh, and, and, I, and I always have. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the heavy breathing and the, you know, the panic is, you know, a lot 